Hi, welcome to the Ghost Man Radio Hi, Station. It's Fred saying Fred before he said to, hello, Fred. But that doesn't matter. This is a show we don't care about things like that. Hello. And um, we're going to talk hello. about a number of subjects, and we don't care what we're going to talk about. But he's going to start. Sorry, Fred. Go ahead, mate. Well, I'm a producer and director, and I've been in business for well over 40 years. And uh, I wanted to share a couple of stories uh, that were kind of profound and uh, eye-opening for me. The first one was when I was in the business. I've been in business for quite some time. And by the time I was uh, 30, I had a multi-million dollar uh, production company in the film, video, and large uh, corporate event business. And a friend of mine introduced me to a psychic, which I did not believe in at all. Uh, just, I, I was open to the possibility from wherever, but I th- didn't have a whole lot of faith in it. So I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do a reading with her. And I, I came in and I had three uh, uh, manila envelopes and with exactly the same amount of paper in each one. And one of them was a real proposal of something I was planning to do. And the other two had blank paper in them. And the proposal was for a television pilot uh, that I was going to pitch pitch to the Discovery Channel. And uh, it was pretty ambitious. I was going to put about a quarter of a million dollars of my own money in it. And I hadn't decided really to do it yet. So I thought this would be kind of fun to see if she could pick up on what's going on. And the name of the show is Flightline. So we sat down and we went through a lot of things and then finally got to the envelopes and she uh, she held each one of them up one at a time and she said, well, I, I get nothing out of this one, nothing at all. And then she held up another one and she said, Oh, oh, this is, I see something up in the air, up in the air. And then she went on to say, oh my gosh, you're going to do this. This is big. You're going to do this. And she started talking about it a little bit. And then she said, oh, I see. I, and she said, this may be, not be channeled information because I know this name. I did, but I just got the name Roland Smith, who was the uh, CBS News correspondent and uh, he was the, Roland Smith was Marriott Hartley, host of the CBS Morning Show years ago. And uh, she says, I don't know what this has to do with it, but I definitely see Roland Smith being involved in this. And then she goes on and on and he says, and there's going to be another person. It's the, the initials are PB. I don't have any idea who this is, but PB is going to be involved in this. And when you see what PB has done, and you talk to him, you're going to like him, but you're really not going to want to hire him, but you will, uh, because, uh, and then she couldn't come up with why. She just said, you will. Excuse me. For the call. <coughs> no, I don't have the virus. And, uh, <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, she went on and on, and she said, you know, this is never going to get aired, but it's going to really successful and when you're all done PB is going to tell you that he learned more from you and, and got more out of this than you did from him and but it's going to be really good and you're going to do it but I don't think it's ever going to see the air so it was maybe four or five months later that I really got started on it because I had other projects I was busy and to fill in a blank uh, uh, in, a, in a summer schedule, I went ahead and started this thing. And I was going to use a local uh, television host to to do the thing and uh, and he he wasn't available, but he, he talked to me and he said, look, there's a, there's a guy here who's a, a national guy he's semi-retired, but he's here in San Diego and uh, he, he called me perfect for this. And I said, who's that? And he says, Roland Smith. First hit. So that was pretty amazing. And then, uh, so I called up and talked to Roland for a minute. And when he walked in the room for our first meeting, it was like I had met my long-lost brother. It was just amazing. And we would go on to do a number of 
projects together and became very, very dear friends, and we remain dear friends to this day. And uh, his, his family and his wife and my wife and everybody, we all got along great. So there's the first hit from this psychic that I totally doubted. And, and, I, and I didn't recall that she had said that. I went, ooh, ooh. <laughs> what is this? It's all about and I start getting busy on some other very large projects that I didn't expect to come in that came in. So I needed somebody to back me up as a producer. And the producer does some creative work, but they also do a lot of uh, legwork and, and fill in. So I was still directing and executive producing the project. Uh, but I needed a producer to come in, somebody who could also do some writing. So Rollins says, why don't you get Paul, Paul Brubaker? He was with NBC New York, and he did all the Jane Polly material. And this show is more of a newsreel kind of thing uh, based on uh, air, aerospace, uh, aviation in space. And of course, what, what Paul Brubaker was doing with Jane Pollard were all what I would call more fluff pieces. They weren't hard, hard news or hard edged kinds of things. And we were going to be a little more edged than that. It was a magazine show. So, but I talked to him on the phone. I really liked him. He was available. Uh, to come out for a couple of months, so I hired him, and he came out, and was, I paid him enough to, he was able to um, have an apartment and everything, and stay out for a couple of months to do this, so so that was going well, next hit, PB, Paul Brubaker, so there's the third hit on it, so we went through and did this whole thing, and did a complete one-hour pilot, we brought in Andrea Naverson from uh, ABC uh, to be the female co-host with Rollin, and put together a really nice show. So then we took it to the Discovery Channel. They saw it, and they called me back and said, well, you need to change the name because we're going to do something called Flightline. But we really love your show. And I said, well, I already have the copyright on it, uh, and it's cleared. So obviously you don't have a copyright on the name. And they said, no, we don't. They said, okay, well, what we were going to do, we'll change the name, but uh, we really like your show. Can you be in, in production on this show in 90 days for the series? And I said, whoa, that's fast, but yes, I have a production company. I have people here. We can do that. We'll just add some more people, but uh, yes, and I have people that are available to come back to help me do the pilot, and the same people will be in the show. So, yeah, all the talent's attached. We can do this. She said, great, I'll be sending a contract. And I'd already submitted a budget and everything, and they it was ready to go. And then I didn't hear from them for a week. And I called in and said, I haven't heard from you guys. What's going on? And they said, oh, uh, the, she was the vice president. She said, they, uh, the uh, reception said, she no longer works here. I said, well, let us let me talk to whoever's in charge. Got to that person's secretary who said, uh, he said that uh, he didn't need to talk to you, but to tell you that everything's been canceled. Every project that she was working on has been canceled. And that's what I found in Hollywood for all these years. That, uh, and that one reason I stayed away from Hollywood for the most part is that there's uh, no integrity. There's no uh, make a commitment, follow through on it. You made a commitment on behalf of the company, but that means nothing with these guys. So it never did air. And... It was just amazing. Everything uh, of the important things that came out of that reading all came true. So I don't know how you feel about that, but that was pretty amazing to me. Well, but I think sometimes, as you say, you do question things, and it's good to question things. I never, I always have, I, every, I know I do cryptozoology and other things, a paranormal and that, but I have a sceptical mind as well. I don't totally believe everything, but I think sometimes... You hear something and you experience these people, you think, oh yeah, there are some very genuine people out there. There's no way this person could have found this out on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, because I didn't even discuss it with my friends. Yeah, because there's certain information people can find out about you quite easily nowadays because of the internet. You know, it can, it's easy to do a cold reading quite, quite simply. So, and your man of intelligence, as I can see, so you would know. I'm all this straight and you, someone was playing you. You think, oh, this person is playing me a bit. I, I can sense this. I can pick it up. I've got this vibe. And as you say, he was listening and thinking, well, how could she know all this? She's never met me. She doesn't know me from Adam. There's no way she could have looked it up. 
Yeah, she couldn't predict no, the future. because I'd never spoken of this before. Yeah. It wasn't anywhere in writing. This was all brand new. So that, that, that's, that just shows it, it, it is, I never knock the ability. I think it's just a selected few who've got the real ability, like everything in life. I think it's only the selected few who've got the absolute ability. Yes, and uh, she would, uh, I found that uh, in, in being in touch with her over the years later, that uh, as she became to know us and know me, uh, I found her to be less accurate. She was accurate on a lot of things. But uh, the more she didn't know, the more accurate she was, which was really interesting. Uh, and then th there was another story that was pretty interesting. This was after 9-11. And it's, uh, it's one of those times when somebody or something just enters your life for a moment. Somebody you don't know, totally random, that really helps you emotionally and spiritually in a way that they now don't even know. And after 9-11, our company lost every job that we had. Everything canceled. Ouch. And we're going, oh my God, we're not going to make it very long here. We're going to run out of money. Kind of like what companies are doing now with this coronavirus. Uh, but uh, all of our work for the next four or five months was canceled. So we're looking, how do you make payroll? How do you, have, you know, you're going to have to lay people off. Uh, how do I pay the rent? All that kind of thing. And we had a, about a 30,000 square foot facility. So we're very, very worried. And I went to lunch with my, my business partner. And we were coming back from lunch. And we were really not happy about our circumstance. Feeling pretty sorry for ourselves. And we looked up. And we came to a stoplight a week, about a block from uh, our, our office. And here is... Somebody multiply handicapped, really, uh, uh, it, it was even worse handicapped. And there was a, a shelter of times that never had seen the people going to the uh, uh, handicapped workshop up the street. We've never seen anybody do that. This is along several years. But here we are stopped the light and they're crossing the street right in front of us and they're way worse than you could do we still had our homes we still had some money in the bank to the physical skills we still had our mental skills and here these people they're much worse than us so it was a, a great Karma does actually work because we've always treated people well and everything. And we needed that reminder to not get we uh, added it up and actually I ended up selling my house. I got another small house and those those kinds of things that that happen able to see them, but they happen, and they are not, in my opinion, totally random. The kind of thing that you've never seen it there before, and then it's right in your face when you meet it, that's that's pretty cool, and that does happen in life, I don't think it happens to a lot of people. And we've got a slight interference on the line. If you can turn your camera off, Fred. Fred, if you turn your camera off, the, 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 if you turn your camera off and we just go audio, it might be a bit better. That's it. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just a slight issue. It's, it's probably because the, the water's in the way. That damn ocean, it always gets in the way. Oh, I would swim over there and do a, a, a virtual, like a stand out your door and go, Hello, Fred, I'm interviewing you, but it's a long swim. <laughs> Where are you right now? I, I am in a place called Holsworthy, 
which is a very small place in Devon. At the moment, our rate of coronavirus is quite low, which is quite a good thing, because we're miles and miles away from London. London is pretty serious. But everywhere's serious, really. I mean, but I look at it this way. I think... Hello. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm going to stop this in a moment. I'll give, I'll give you a... Well, right, we're back on. We had a, what we call in the, the trade a technical fault. And normally in the UK, we used to have a little... little um, girl come up holding a very creepy clown on BBC One. It used to be a little test card. It used to say, bang, the programme will resume soon. And it was a very creepy clown. You have to look it up, this picture. You'll look at the clown and go, that clown was really, really creepy. Anyway, where were we? We were talking about... Uh, we were just, yeah, we talked about uh, counting your blessings and when things uh, happen, whether it's the coronavirus or 9-11 or anything that's completely out of your control. You feel somewhat helpless. You're you really are at the at the mercy of whatever it's going to be. And I, what I believe, and, uh, and I've heard from others as well, uh, it's not unique to, to my experience. But if you stop and take a breath and look around, you can't change what's going on in the big world. But you can do something about how you feel about it, how you react to it, and what you do. And you can take positive measures that are the best you can do under the circumstances. And that's what we human beings do. And some behave very uh, favorably and honorably uh, and find some peace within whatever the, the fate is that uh, has, has occurred and find a, a, a path to guide them through it. And others freak out. Well, and I'm, I'm a great and, believer in... If you look in history, because I'm a history buff, you look at all the plagues that we have, we've had the Black Death, we've had the Spanish flu, which wiped out millions of people, but we survived that. I think, basically, we have these things now and again to teach us a lesson, to say, look, come on, you're not invincible. It surprised me how quick the economy blew up, though. There, no, there doesn't seem to be anybody who's able to think... Oh, I must put something away, just in case. Just in case. But that just in case is always yeah. that, that mole away. I think if we learn one thing, that's one thing we ought to learn. The other thing is we've got to learn we're not invincible. Anything can get us at any time. This could happen again. We don't know. We just don't know. But yeah. I, and I, I think this, this will change the world a little bit. I don't think it'll change it completely, but we will be more wary of things. I think you're absolutely correct. Absolutely correct on that. And uh, one of the other things I wanted to talk about that I think is extremely helpful to people, and I do a lot of master class seminars for production people, because I'm a writer, producer, and director. I've got over 100 awards, and I've run a multi million dollar company uh, outside of Hollywood. And goals are so important, and and it really goes all the way back to Norman Vincent Peale's the first book about the power of positive thinking. But it's the idea, and this has been well documented, uh, that the most successful people do have goals, and they may be pretty broad goals. They're not like uh, I'm going to do some little specific thing. That's a sub goal or an objective. But the big goal is to do something. And for a little kid, it's what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, when I was 12 years old, uh, there was a class, one of our, uh, I think it was my English class in junior high school. And the teacher did a, what we would today call a, uh, an aptitude test. Of, and it was really what do you want to be when you grow up kind of test. But it asked you about how you felt about this, doing this or that, or what kind of things you liked. And everybody then came up with what they wanted to be. 
And mine was I wanted to be an audio engineer. I wanted to be a professional trumpet player. I'd start playing trumpet in the third grade. And I also wanted to be a pilot. And most of all, I wanted to be a TV director. And before I was 30, I had, uh, well, I, I turned pro as a musician at uh, 17 years of age with a rock band that was playing and making money. And by the time I was 18, I was playing at Disneyland with my own group and playing in Disney bands. Um, I, during that time to pay for school, I was doing not only the music, but I started mixing sound for the big rock bands, and I did Steppenwolf, Can't Heat, Three Dog Night, Booty Blues, on and on and on, as they came through Southern California, because at that time, uh, the big groups did not carry their own sound. They hired the big sound company in each city, so I was hooked up with a pretty big sound company, and I was the main mix guy for these guys, like Tina Turner, Three Dog Night, all of them. So I was doing that, I achieved that before I was out of college, and then uh, I directed my first television show commercially when I was 18 years old through a junior achievement program, which is a, a program for teenagers put on by local businessmen. And the sponsor of this particular uh, chapter was the local TV station. And they gave us a shot. We had to produce it. We had to sell it, sell the advertising. We had to put it together. And their technical crew, a professional technical crew, would help us. But we were, all of the uh, key staff positions were us teenagers, 18 and 19 year olds. And uh, we did it. And it was turned out to be decent. I mean, it is what it is. It was Saturday afternoon live broadcast. So I went on to become a, a real director, went through school and so forth, and produced, I produced huge shows and videos and IMAX films and a feature film and, and so on. But those goals were always in the back of my head. And I'd done those when I was 12 years old. And my mom, when I was about 16, 17, found the book where she had kept all my old stuff. And this is one of those things she kept. Give me the piece of paper with those goals on it. I went, holy crap. They were, they were planted in the back of my mind, and I never lost them. And having read, looked at them, at, I guess I was 18 or 19, realized I was doing a lot of it, and it really helped me focus where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. So having those goals is important, and staying positive when everything turns to crap is also important, very important, uh, to keep your, your center and keep your heart. And one of the other things that I found most important was about keeping your integrity. And I learned that from my parents, my father in particular, about your word is your bond. Don't ever forget that. And don't make promises you can't you know you can't keep. Make promises that you can keep and if something happens that you can't keep it, own up to the responsibility for it and fix it. Call it talk to the people you made the promise to. And here's what happened, here's why, whether, whatever it was, hopefully it was out of your control, but even if it was in, within your control, but you, you blew it, own it and fix it. And years later, I was working with a brilliant, brilliant executive named Mike Gunn, who was the senior vice president of marketing for American Airlines. And he was telling me one time about uh, customer satisfaction, keeping customers, and he said, in the airline business, one of the things that makes people the maddest uh, is not a canceled flight because the canceled flight because of a mechanical or weather, people understand. But when you lose their bags, there's no excuse for that. You're just really screwed up. But he said, but how well you fix it after that happens can be the difference between having a loyal customer for a very long time or losing a customer. And I actually had that happen on a flight to Hawaii. They lost my bags, but the people in whatever baggage center I was talking to were so good. They said, we found your bag. It's this. It was on a wrong flight. We're sending it over. It'll be taken care of, and you'll have it by morning. And because it was the next flight out, Dallas, or wherever it was. So uh, then they followed up, called me first thing in the morning, and said, the flight has arrived. Your bag is there. And uh, they should be getting it out to you soon, but we'll let you know when it's on the truck. And then when it was 
on the truck finally. They called and said it should be at your hotel in the next 20 minutes. Look for it. And then after 30 minutes went by, and we did have the, 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 the luggage. It was there. It was delivered just as promised. She called again and said, I want to make sure that you got your luggage and that everything's okay. Now, that kind of customer service and follow-up on fixing a screw-up is very key, not only in a professional life and in a business, and in any business, but it's really the same lesson can be found in your personal life, when, whether it's an interpersonal relationship or a business relationship or whatever. If you're the one that screwed up and then you fix it really, really well, that will earn you, I'll call it good karma, call it what you want, but uh, that will show that you can be a trusted person. And trust is everything. It's the hardest thing to earn and the easiest thing to lose. That's why I tell my kids. I tell my kids the same. I tell my kids the same thing. My kids are very polite. Always tell my granddad always say, used to tell me, always be polite to people. He said, politeness gets you a very long way. Yes, in, 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 my, in my case, was my grandmother, and she used to say uh, the, the saying about uh, you can catch more, uh, uh, catch, more, catch more bees with honey than you can with vinegar, or something like that. But it's very true, though, isn't it? The, the, the same kind of thing. Uh, you just... The squeaky wheel does get some attention, but doesn't earn you any uh, extra points. And if you just be nice, I mean, I've been in lines at the airport, and you get somebody in front of you who's just going off on the on the agent about something, and then you come up and you're really, really nice. And all of a sudden, if there's a seat in first class, they upgrade you. <laughs> so you remember, yeah, yeah. And that could, does happen. Yeah. I've had it happen to me. I've had lots of people help me out. Now, I'm going to mention your book now, Advocate for the Audience. Now you've got to hear something along the lines. Just as you did, this, just how you did, you did you do it? Finding new clients, funders, getting so many big budget assignments nationwide, earn over 100 major awards, keep huge multinational clients coming back for over 30 years in a row, a path to long-term success for both the executives, funders and buyers of the creative media and those who work creating the videos, events of all kinds, of non-broadcast and broadcast projects are explained in detail. Lots of real case study experiences. Success and failures revealed and proven techniques explained with examples. See how to separate yourself from the crowd, build your brand and make a good living at it outside of Hollywood. years to write the book. It was after I quote-unquote retired. And uh, I'll tell you what, in writing that book, I, I discovered that I had honed the, uh, the art of procrastination. I had honed procrastination into a fine art. <laughs> I, it was one of the harder things I've ever done, because I've never sat down and looked at, I just did things because I, I instinctively was doing them, and then I went back and analyzed it and looked at it, well, how did you keep these giant companies for all these years, and how did, you, how did you work this and do this? And I looked at all these different aspects of it, and I said, you know something, I can do something for the people coming up, because I had a lot of really big-time pros along the way help me uh, build my career, even as a young guy, and when I would be able to do a shoot on a Hollywood stage, I would make sure I had the best guys up there, and I would empower them. I'd, I'd tell them, look, I'm the new, new young director, which means that I don't know as much as I think I know. But you guys are the pros, and I'm looking at you to not let me screw up. Here's what we're trying to do, but if you see me doing something that could be done better, you, you have my permission. Matter of fact, I'm asking you, stop the production, come over to me and say, no, 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 do it this way. And occasionally they would. And it made the project better, it made me better, and I wanted to give back some of that to the young people coming up today because it's a very competitive business. So that's that's what the book is about, and it is available. Uh, and I ship, uh, and I didn't put it on Amazon because they wanted to triple the price that I'm selling it for. And uh, I've got the the uh, both hardcover and, and a paperback 
version of it, 300 pages with a lot of color pictures in it too. And uh, they can get it at my website, which is www.fredashman.com, A-S-H-M-A-N, F-R-E-D, Ashman.com, all one word. And uh, so that's, that's one of the things that I'm doing to put that out there. And here I am in quote unquote retirement, and a, a year and a half ago I directed 10 episodes of a broadcast series. I'm under contract now to uh, develop and uh, hopefully get on the air, uh, and then put, come up with a lot of money to let me do it. As the, they hired me as their executive producer, they want me to direct the pilot in the first four uh, shows of the series for a new a one-hour uh, variety show, and it's Latin. Uh, based uh, musical variety uh, with uh, a big set and uh, it's kind of like what you would see on I think you have the British version and we have the American version of The Voice uh, that kind of production value but it's definitely a Spanish, English, Latin flavor and a lot more spectacle involved so they're having, I'm, I'm working on that As a matter of fact I was working on it this morning before our call um, putting it together and starting to build the team to do a pilot uh, late this year. So I'm under contract for that, but I'm also uh, directing uh, one episode. It's a second episode of a new drama series uh, that I've been hired to direct. So that's my retirement. So I'm having fun. Well, that's the main thing, really isn't it? That I was able that's to be on your, your show. I'm looking at your pictures of the of some of the artists you work with. I, I, I recognise, well, the one I most, most recognise is James Gardner, obviously, Rock for Fowls. I used to watch that religiously over there. They used to have a series of detective programmes, Pot to Jelly, Kojak, uh-huh. Rock to Fowls, Columbo, Cannon. See, I'm going back to the bleak. Uh-huh. I'm going to the next yeah, years there. Yeah. Very sensible man, yeah, very sensible man. Yeah, well, he said it was actually cheaper to uh, rent a place than it was to rent a house. Yeah, well, Yeah, yeah, I remember he, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know he was in lots and lots of yeah. things. Wasn't he in um, Dynasty? Well, we used to call it Dynasty, yeah, and it's called Dynasty, but... Uh, we... Dynasty, yes. Yeah, we used to yeah. call it Dynasty because... Dynasty, everybody... Dynasty, everybody used to do... Yeah, Dynasty, 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 Dynas
work with. But he did have one little quirk that I found interesting, and I found out later he did. He would not watch playbacks, and he wouldn't watch the films or the TV shows he was in. And when we finished a recording, I said, well, I'll, you know, I'll do a playback. You can hear it and see what you think. And he says, what I think doesn't matter. You're the director. If you're happy, I'm happy. So you go ahead and listen to everything, and if you need me to redo something, tell me what you want different, and I'll do it. Uh, and he was really nice, but he did not listen to his own stuff back, uh, which was an interesting quirk. But uh, he did a great job. I mean, I don't think I took, did more than three takes on any on any of his lines. He was terrific. I know your little picture of the of the helicopter that you got on your site. Do you fly a helicopter? Uh, I don't fly helicopters. Uh, I, I actually took a lesson. Uh, I have uh, almost, well, I've got 4,600 hours of pilot command in airplanes. I've owned four airplanes along the way and uh, flown all over the place. But I also have directed out of helicopters a lot. So I thought, um. well, I better understand a little bit more how they work and maybe... I took a lesson in the Jet Ranger with one of the top, top pilots who do this film work. And so I was able to take it off. You know, we did a little ground school, and then we went out. I was able to take off and fly around and, and maneuver it without, a, without really a problem. I probably wasn't the smoothest, but I, it was, I was safe and I was okay. And he brought, had me bring it around and make the approach into the helipad to land. And he said, now we're going to hover. And he's talking me through it, and I came right down and slowed down and got right into the hover. And I was able to hold the hover for about three seconds before I started losing control. <laughs> and he takes the controls and has it stabilized instantly. And he starts to laugh. He says, here, try it again. And he's got, it's all stable. He says, don't over control it. And I started, you know, within about three seconds, I started losing it again. We did that about three or four times, and then he went ahead and, and landed. And, uh... And he said, don't worry, you fixed wing guys take about six to eight hours of practice before you can hover, and then you're okay. And, and normal guys coming in who don't have any experience take two or three hours more. But it's, it's, it's a learned thing. It's a motor skill thing uh, in muscle memory. So you, you can get it, but it takes that kind of time. And, you know, at three or four hundred dollars an hour, I didn't want to do the practice time because I didn't want to be a helicopter pilot. They're too expensive. <laughs> but because uh, I let the pros do that kind of work. But I did do uh, a lot of uh, flying from the right seat in jets. Wow. Uh, shooting in IMAX and in 35 millimeter of uh, air-to-air work for American Airlines and other airlines. And I also did Learjet. Uh, we did work for uh, Galaxy Aerospace, which is now uh, the Gulfstream 100 and uh, for Dassault Falcon jets. So I've done a lot of air-to-air work, uh, flying co-pilot and directing with a really super experienced uh, captain who does the real close formation work. And I mean, we get close. There was one time we were overlapping wings on another Learjet uh, for the introduction of the Learjet 45. Uh, That is real precision flying, and we make real sure that uh, the pilot on the other, in the plane we're uh, taking pictures of is just as good. You've got to have people with uh, formation experience. And we did. Uh, it was so much fun. So much fun. I never really told my insurance guy about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at some of your shows on your site. It, it's quite, I mean, people say, oh, you, but they don't realize how much goes into a, just a simple commercial people think oh it's just a three minute film but it's not really a three minute film it can take three weeks just to do that three minute film yes it, uh, you know for every yeah. hour on set you probably put in uh multiple days worth of planning depending on you know what the project is uh the project i'm planning for this pilot is actually well, it, it stalled for a year while I was waiting for them to go get the money, more money. Uh, they hired me right at first to develop the concept. We did that, and then it's gone on to the next phase. But it, it's it's probably a year to a year and a half's work to put it together and assemble the team and get all the creative and the thinking worked out. And then, even once you get into it, you 
find that some of your planning was faulty, uh, you'll find that, well, we thought that would be so cool, and it's not, so we're going to fix it. So that's part of the art. And, and as I tell a lot of the uh, young people coming up, and even some of the people who are established, is don't ever forget it's team art. And you need to surround yourself with experts in other areas of the field who are better than you. Uh, you're, if you're the producer or director, fine, you know what you want to do, you know what you, how you want to, you, you know sort of how you want to get it done, but you know what the end result should be, and then you assemble these other people to do it, because it is too hard. So, you got dogs? Kind of the, uh, you know, we, we have a little dog, and uh, the, the uh, UPS truck must have driven by because yeah. he's working. Yeah, yeah, we got little Jack Russell, she does the same. It's because Naughty's is carrying it at the moment, it's like you go out and go, you can hear the birds, and it's like, whoa, this is like the horror films I always watched as a kid. I'm living the horror film I always watched as a kid. <laughs> uh, I have finally uh, one last thing that is kind of an uh, interesting aside, and it goes to the idea of trust and integrity, which are the core of everything. Uh, and it's really one of the, it's probably the biggest reason, we're, we're very good at what we do, but there's a lot of people who are good at what they do. But if you have the trust of people and you can show them that you have their best interests at heart, and this goes to what uh, a CEO told me very early in my career, uh, and that was, if you're making a deal, you should be able to get up and walk to the other side of the table when you're discussing the terms. And you should be able to take a, their position and, and sit in their chair, and they should be able to sit in your chair, and you can both say, oh, this is a fair deal. And when I was doing my, uh, my feature film, I got uh, some people that uh, had never, ever helped finance a feature film before, and they became sponsors, which means they gave me the money up front, cash, seven figures each, up front in cash before a script was written based on my presentation to them and then I had to write a contract for them and I went to an uh, entertainment lawyer in LA because it's a, a feature film and told them I said I want you to write this contract but I want you to represent them every bit as much as me I want a contract that they look at and they go oh my god this guy took care of us and took care of himself he says well look you know, I, I'm supposed to represent you to get your best deal. I said, I don't want that. That's a win. Uh, one guy gets a better deal than the other. I said, I want, uh, here's all the terms. We've already worked out the basic terms. I need to put it in legalese, but I need all the wherefores and all of the, all the little things that I wouldn't know about to put in there to protect them and their copyrights and everything else because we're going to use their logos, um, you know, as, as part of the credits and all that. So long story short was, he did it, and the, the companies you probably recognize, Coca-Cola, MasterCard International, American Airlines, and Walmart, and McDonald's. And the day that the Walmart contract was going to be signed, well, I did, excuse me, let me back up. The day that the McDonald's contract was going to be signed, I got a call from the vice president who had approved it, and everything was approved. It was done. They were ready to write a check. And he called and he said, well, I've got bad news. Uh, I, he said, bad news for me and bad news for you. He said, the new president just came in and fired nearly all the vice presidents and canceled all of our projects. Sounds like the Discovery Channel. <laughs> and, uh, so you're, you're not going to have McDonald's as a sponsor. And so that went away. And then a few days later, I got a call from the head of legal at Walmart. And I'm thinking, oh, no, this is another thing. There's a problem. What's going on? And uh, this is the, the main guy. And this project is, you know, it's seven figures, but it's not huge seven figures. And this is the guy that handled the giant stuff for Walmart. And he called personally. I'm going, uh-oh, something's wrong. So I took the call, and he introduced himself, and I said, what's wrong? He says, nothing. That's why I'm calling you. He says, in my 30 years in this business, I have never seen a contract that was written so well that not 
protected you and represented all of the terms that we all agreed to, but it protected us equally as well. This is the first contract in my 35 years with the Walmart Corporation that we have not, none of my lawyers nor I have any changes to the contract. This is a first. And he says, I just wanted to congratulate you and have you call your lawyer and congratulate uh, Michael in New York, I mean, in uh, Los Angeles, he was in uh, Santa Monica. And call him and tell him that, that, you know, this is a pretty big compliment for a lawyer. So we did that, and it just spoke to the idea of trust and your integrity, because that becomes your personal brand. What is your personal brand? How do you live your life, and how do people see you? Are you the one that they can always trust and know that if you said you're going to do something, you're going to do it? Or are you the person who will always say, yeah, 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 I'll always be there for you, then you're never there, are there. How do you live your life? What do you do? And those are things that you have to do by taking action, not words. So anyway, I thought that was a really fun story. And once again, I went to somebody really, really good and just gave them direction and got the hell out of the way, and they did their magic, and their magic worked. Well, sometimes you've got to do that, ain't you? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Now, I see you got your fan of model trains. I am a fan of model trains. I have a pretty large layout up in uh, northern Minnesota. We have a my uh, daughter and son-in-law and four little girls live up there. And uh, so we bought a place next door to them. They're out in the country, and she uh, teaches equestrian. Uh, he's a master electrician. And uh, got, they have their own electrical company, but they take care of the four little girls, and she has horses and such. So we bought 30 acres next door and uh, have, a, have a place there. So it came with a 2,000-square-foot, they call it a barn, but it's really a, a steel building with... Uh, concrete floor and it's heated and everything because everything has to be heated up there in the winter. It gets so darn cold. But uh, the uh, the place was empty and I and I had these outdoor trains that they're G scale, so they're quite large. Uh, you got an HO, they're, they're about 10 times larger than an HO. Uh, an engine is probably a foot to a foot and a half long, depending on the engine. So you have, I had all these outside here in California, but we, when I retired and the kids were gone, we moved from uh, the, that property to our, our current house, and there wasn't really room in the yard, because this is, I had over a thousand feet of track outside. So I built this indoors up in Minnesota, and the hobby's really building it. Uh, I love to run it for the kids, and the kids like to run it and everything, but um, it's just a, a great hobby, and I wanted to have something to do in my retirement, not knowing I'd end up being as busy as I am. But I still get up there and when we visit and have fun with that. Oh, well, you might have Rod Stewart come around and help you. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. Uh, I thought you might have to see a Rod Stewart coming around to come and help you. No, no well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I saw Rod uh, Stewart's layout, and uh, uh, knowing how much he travels and everything else, I think there's no question he had some professional help because that is a phenomenal, wonderful, wonderful layout. And uh, but uh, uh, more power to it because I'm sure he had a great hand in the design and probably some of the construction as well. But wow, what a cool layout he has! Well, as always, you he, he so sort of run out when you do these shows. It's like, oh my God, you've got so much time and you never have enough time to talk about things. But we think we cover most of the things that we're talking about. Anyway, um, I like to normally do like a unique sign-off. So what would your unique sign-off be to the world we are presently in? I would say, as you face each and every day, understand that you cannot control what happened in the past, and you cannot control the many of the big things that are going to happen around you in the world in the future, but you control how you react to them and how you live each day. And I would further say, cherish every day of your life, because you never know when it's going to end, 
and nobody gets off the planet vertically. All right, most of my view. Somewhere in the future, Fred is going to do a a a, a little directory thing called self isolation. How we survived it, and he's going to have. Various people coming on with phone messages saying, I survived by doing a podcast with Mark on the Ghostman radio station. I survived by reading a book. But basically, we're all, at the moment, we're all together. And I've had a great chat. I like the, I'm going to end with these little quote. Creating means meaning through film and performance. That was ability to impact on an audience. There's nothing more thrilling. I think there's more than that worth that describes the person that I have been talking to. Excellent. Right, I just...